Okay. Looking for the attendees. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, we're just going to wait just to let everyone join, get a chance to join. But thank you for joining this evening on this miserable evening. But um, we're just going to wait a little bit longer so that everyone has a chance to join. Thanks again, everyone, for joining this evening. We're just going to wait just a just a minute or two, just so that everyone has a chance to join and we don't miss any of the, our webinar tonight. Okay, so I'll just, I'll kick off um, tonight. We'll still have, still probably a few more people to join, but we'll, I'll kick off the introductions anyway. So my name's Aoife Bradson and I'm the head of marketing comms for, for Sins IVF. Um, Sins IVF um, is one of the largest provider of fertility treatment in Ireland. Um, we have locations all across Ireland. So we have our three main clinics. So one of them is our swords clinic where Mandy um, tonight is the lab manager which is in North Dublin. We have Plonsky in South Dublin, and then we also have a clinic in Cork as well. Um, we do have three other locations, as we call them satellite clinics. So this is where you can get your bloods and scans done and carried out while you're on cycle. So you don't have to do multiple trips to our Dublin or Cork clinics. So those are in Dundalk, Limerick and Carlow. We're also, um, our parent company is Virtus Health. So they are a global provider of fertility health. So we have a, a great network of support behind us. Um, so just wanted to welcome you all tonight. Thank you again for, for uh, attending this webinar. And if you have any questions at all, just pop them into the Q&A box and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. I'll just introduce you now to Mandy Leslie. She is our lab manager in the SWORDS clinic. So I'll let you take it away, Mandy. Okay, thank you very much, Aoife. So good evening to everybody. So my name is Mandy and I'm the lab manager in Sims IVF and Swords. Um, so we'd like to welcome you to our embryology lab. And this evening we'll be talking about the IVF cycle from a lab perspective. And then we'll be delving a little bit deeper into one particularly special service that we offer and that's the pre-implantation genetic testing. So if I can get, here we go, okay. So firstly, I'll just give you a quick overview of the IVF cycle and a little bit about the embryology. And then we'll go in a little bit deeper into the genetics and then the specifics of the, the PGT cycle itself. So an IVF cycle firstly involves a series of hormone injections, blood tests and monitoring scans. And that happens over a period of about 10 to 14 days. So this is closely monitored by our doctors and our nursing staff. And the aim is to achieve the best possible ovarian response from these hormones for each particular patient. So once we've made a decision that the follicles or the egg sacs, which are growing in the ovaries, uh, have reached an appropriate size, then we'll be telling the patient to take a trigger injection. And the trigger injection is given to mimic the surge of hormones that you usually see around the time of ovulation. So this injection stimulates the eggs that are growing in the ovaries to mature, and then we can collect them using a surgical procedure just before they ovulate. So like I said, the eggs are collected surgically, meaning that the patient will be sedated and a needle is used to puncture each one of the follicles in her ovary and collect the fluid from the follicles. So this picture, I can get a little laser point. This picture is what follicular fluid looks like. So it's often this straw colored yellow kind of thing here, often tinged again with a little bit of blood that makes it kind of red. But then the, when the follicular fluid is collected, the embryologist takes the fluid and places it into a dish and then searches under a microscope to find the eggs. So this is one of our microscopes here in the lab. You can see we've got the microscope, which is sitting inside a humidity crib. 
And this keeps the eggs at a constant temperature and atmosphere. So while we're finishing searching for all the eggs, searching through all the follicular fluid, we're keeping the eggs nice and warm and stable. <clears throat> so once the eggs are found, they're placed into a clean dish and put in the incubator for a few hours. So you can see this picture down the bottom here. This is a picture of an egg that's been freshly collected from the ovary. So you can see the egg is a little circle in the middle here, and it's surrounded by a cloud of cells. Now this cloud of cells is called a cumulus, and the cumulus protects it while it's growing in the follicle. So once we've collected all of the eggs, they go into the incubator, and then we'll ask the male partner to go into a collection room where he can produce his semen sample, and that will be used to inseminate the eggs later on in the afternoon. So this is a video of a fresh sperm sample. So when we get a sperm sample into the lab, what we're looking for is several things. So the first thing we want to look at is the concentration. So how many sperm there are in the sample. The next thing we want to look for is the motility. So how well are those sperm moving? Are they fast? Are they slow? Are they just sitting there and just twitching their tails? Um, and the third thing we would look for is morphology. Now, morphology is what the sperm cells themselves look like. So the majority of human sperm actually looks abnormal. So you can see this picture up here. This is what a normal human sperm looks like, but the vast majority of the sperm sample will actually look something like this or worse. Um, so when we get the semen sample into the lab, what we want to do is to prepare the sample to filter out all of the dead sperm, anything that's not moving very well, We'd also take off the, uh, the seminal fluid. So we're just left with the good quality sperm. When we're done with that, it, that's the sperm that we'll use later on in the afternoon to, to inseminate the eggs. So depending on the sperm quality, the insemination can be done either one of two ways. So the first technique is what we, most people would think of when we say IVF, meaning that we would simply mix the eggs and the sperm together and just let, it, let them fertilize themselves. So that's recommended if the sperm sample is good quality, there's plenty of them and they're moving nicely. So if there are fewer sperm than we would like, or if they're not moving very well, then we would, we would do something that's referred to as an ICSI insemination. So what that means is that we take a single sperm and we inject into each of the mature eggs that we've collected uh, earlier that morning. So this is a common occurrence, maybe 50% of, of all cycles that come through the clinic would be an ICSI insemination procedure. And the idea is to maximize the, the fertilization of the eggs that we've collected. So this is just to talk about the, the different methods of insemination. So this first image you can see, this is the IVF, the standard, what everybody would think about of IVF would be, we just mix the eggs and the sperm together. The eggs would swim towards the egg, the, sorry, the sperm would swim towards the eggs and hopefully fertilize them. Now this is obviously the, the least invasive technique that we will be doing. So the next video is showing, if I can get it to play for you. Are you going to play or not? Let me just try it. Sorry now. A bit of the laser pointer here. So this video shows an embryologist. So we're catching a single good-looking sperm. You can see our little glass tube. This is a little glass pet. We swipe across the sperm's tail and that stops it moving. Now we do this for two reasons. The first reason is that it releases some activation factors which help start the process of fertilization in the egg. And it also makes it easier for us to catch the sperm. So you would have seen, we would have sucked the, the sperm tail first into the little glass tube, into the little glass pipette. And then once we've done that, we can stop that one and we'll start this one. So once we've caught our sperm, we go into a separate drop and this is where all our eggs are located. So you can see this one, we're holding on to the egg with a little bit of suction on this side of it. So this is a glass pipette again, a little bit of suction, so we're holding it still. So we inject the egg, you can see we suck back a little bit, the membrane of the egg itself breaks, and then we're gonna put the sperm, which is here, all the way back into the egg, remove the glass pipette, and that's it. We have inseminated that egg. So all the mature eggs can be collected, sorry, can be injected with a single sperm. So we know that this egg is mature because of the presence of this little guy up the top here. So this little fragment shows us that it's gone through its final maturation process. And that was because of the trigger injection that we gave the patient to mimic the, mimic the, the ovulation. Um, so the little bit of gentle suction holds it still, because if you, if you think about it, you're injecting something smaller than a full stop. So we want to make sure it stays still while we put, while we, um, put the needle in it with the sperm. 
So we need to make sure that we're going in at the best angle as well. So you'll see that here, we're keeping very flat, we're keeping nice and, and slowly into, into the egg, push in, pull back a little bit so it breaks and make sure the, the sperm is then introduced into the egg. So fertilization rates with ICSI are typically higher than with IVF, statistically higher, um, because obviously we're putting a single sperm into each of the eggs. And this bypasses some of the reasons why eggs don't fertilize. So it is obviously more invasive where we're injecting the sperm with a needle. Um, so we do run the risk of the egg degenerating, which is why we go to great lengths to train all our embryologists to be able to do this technique. So it's, it takes you know, hundreds and hundreds of eggs, of training eggs, for us to, to be able to say, yes, you know, we're, we're happy with the, the standard of this field of these embryologists. So an XC cycle would be, in addition to being preferred for porous sperm quality, could also be done in the case of a previous failed fertilization, or in some cases, um, men don't produce sperm into their ejaculate, so we may have to go and directly harvest sperm and testicular tissue from the testicles, and in that case, ICSI would be the only option for those patients as well. So once we've done the insemination, the following morning, what we're looking for is fertilization. So this is day one, what we would refer to in the lab as day one, and we want to see the presence of these two little disc shapes. So these two little disc shapes, you can see here, they're actually two, they're overlapping here. Um, and these are what we call pronuclei. So these two pronuclei show us that the egg is normally fertilized. So anything more or less, you can see there's three over here, one, two, three, and this one just has a single one. So they're abnormally fertilized and they won't be used any longer in the, in the, the IVF cycle. So once we complete the fertilization check, we phone the patient, um, to, to let them know how many of their eggs are fertilized and then we'll be continuing their journey within the laboratory. So the piece of equipment that we use for growing these embryos, and this is how I've managed to get these images, the, uh, the piece of equipment is called an embryoscope. So the embryoscope is an incubator with a camera inside. So it takes a picture of each embryo every 20 minutes and can show us how well the embryo is developing over the coming days. And it even the technology can even put all those bit all those pictures together to create a video at the end. So what we're looking at here is an embryo developing over the first five days of development. So these little bubbles are cells. They are surrounded by a jelly shell. So that shell is called the zona pellucida. And we want to see nice even cells. We want to see minimal numbers of little fragments. So there's a few little fragments over here. We want to see appropriate cell numbers for each day. So it should be between, between two and four cells is normal for day two. Between sort of the eight and 10, maybe sometimes up to 12 cells would be on day three. On day four, we would see here the cells kind of lose their definition. They start to compact. And that's the embryo organizing itself into that blastocyst structure that we're hoping to see on day five and day six. So when a patient is planning their PGT cycle, we would always do something called assisted hatching as well. And this means usually either day three or day five of embryonic development, we would put a little hole in this jelly shell. So you can see the jelly shell here is quite thick. We would put a little hole in the jelly shell so that the, by the time we get to day five, the embryo is starting to hatch out. So you can see down here when we're starting with uh, this is sort of the morning of day five or the afternoon of day four we're coming into day five. The embryo is starting to form a blastocyst. So it's um, just starting to open up in the middle. So you can see it's opening up a little bit further here and it's starting to expand as well. So this is the embryo here. This is the blastocyst. It's actually hatching out of the jelly shell. And this is when we've artificially hatched it for a PGT cycle. It will be hatching quite a lot. So we're growing embryos to day five or day six. So we'll talk a little bit more specifically about the blastocyst. So the first thing we're looking for when we're looking at blastocysts is expansion. So the embryo, like I said, is surrounded by a jelly shell and it protects the embryo while it is fertilizing, while it is growing. So during early development, it's quite thick. And you can see as, we, as the, the developmental path continues, it thins out. So, once the, the blastocyst gets big enough, the shell is quite thin, the shell will actually crack open to allow the embryo to hatch outside. And this would be the embryo preparing to attach to the uterine lining. So expansion of the embryo will be graded in the lab and it's graded a number from one through six. So one would be like this, 
So it's only just starting to form a blastus. It's just starting to, to kind of open out. And number six, in terms of expansion, would be completely hatched outside of the shell. So this would be kind of a number one, number two, probably number four, given that it's spinning out a little bit. This is pushing its way out and hatching number five. And once it's completely outside, would be number six. So when we're looking at blastocysts, we can no longer count the cells. So when we were looking at them earlier, if I go back one, we can count the cells here. There's two cells, there's four cells, there's 12 cells. When we're looking at these embryos, we can no longer count the cells. So what we do know about blastocysts is there is now two distinct populations of cells. So the next thing we look for when we're looking at blastocyst quality is the population of cells called the inner cell mass. Now this is the inner cell mass here, and that's the bit that makes the baby. So the inner cell mass is gonna be graded in the lab, either A, B or C, with A being the top grade. And the last thing that we would look for in terms of blastocyst quality would be the population of cells called the trifectoderm. And the trifectoderm is the part of the embryo that is gonna create a placenta, and all the extra membranes involved in creating the pregnancy. So the trifectoderm is also going to be graded A, B or C, with A being the top grade. So when the embryologist phones the patient to discuss embryo quality or blastocyst quality um, over the phone, or if we're seeing a patient for a transfer or for a, um, a freeze, we would tell them the grades of their embryos. So if the embryologist says your embryo was a 3AA or a 5BB, this is how we determine the quality. So the first number is the expansion. The second letter is the quality of the inner cell mass. So this little bit down here that makes the baby. And the third letter is the quality of the trifectoderm. So this is a video. So this is three little embryos developing from the point from fertilization up until day five of development. So we use these videos to help us choose the best embryo out of the group. So we can see the exact time that each embryo divides. And then if they divide evenly or if one embryo is excluding some of its cells. So I'll just start this playing and you can just watch. So, oh, it's actually quite fast. <laughs> so dividing two cells into four cells, into eight cells, this is about day three. The cells will then start to compact. So here you can see them compacting and then they're gonna start opening out into that blastocyst structure that we were just talking about. So we, oh, it's gonna keep playing, okay, sorry. <laughs> So we see them dividing into, we know that embryos that divide into two cells before 24 hours have a much better chance of forming or pregnancy, say, than an embryo which takes more than 30 hours to divide. So by having these images, being able to put them together into a video and having the time points at the bottom, it gives us a much better idea about which would be the best embryo of the group. So it's also a very good training tool for our training embryologists to actually see how embryos divide and they become aware of why that's important. So the trainees would spend hundreds of hours watching videos like these and it takes over two years to produce a fully trained embryologist because there's so, so many intricacies that go into it. So the next thing that I'd like to talk about, we've talked about the embryology and a bit about the blastocysts. So why we're here is the PGT. So we'll talk a little bit about the genetics and why that's important. So this is each cell in our body. So inside each cell is a nucleus, and the nucleus is the round structure that acts like the cell's brain. So the nucleus tells each cell of the body what to do, and the reason that it knows this is due to the presence of the chromosomes inside it. So here's the chromosomes. All these little green guys in the middle, here's a chromosome. So each cell in our body has a set of 23 pairs of chromosomes. So you inherit 23 chromosomes from your mother, and 23 from your father, which makes a total of 46 chromosomes. So these chromosomes are made up of coils of DNA. So it's this DNA that's responsible for building and maintaining our human structure. So the, when you hear about genes, genes are little parts of DNA, little segments of the DNA that give you your physical characteristics, and that's what makes you unique. So each gene is like one specific set of instructions within uh, I'd say one specific recipe, say, within the cookbook of a nucleus. So the information the genes carry makes you who you are and determines what you look like. So whether you have straight hair or curly hair or long legs or short legs or sometimes even how you smile or how you laugh. So 
they can also be responsible for passing on other not so nice characteristics such as diseases. So for example, sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease, for example, would be a gene defect or inherited through, through genes. So our body has this whole instruction manual of the 46 chromosomes that is telling our cells how to behave. So if one of these chromosomes is missing, or if there's an extra chromosome, then the body functions differently. And it may or may not even be compatible with life. So if we look down the bottom here, this is an, a, a karyotype. So a karyotype is a picture of the chromosomes of, of a cell in the body. So this is a, pit normal, a picture of a normal male karyotype. So you can see there's two here. These are chromosome ones. So there's two chromosome ones, two chromosome twos, two chromosome threes, and so on. And when we get down to the bottom here, there's a single chromosome here. This is X and a single chromosome here, this is Y. So this is an XY normal male karyotype. So if it was a female, there'd be two X chromosomes, just the fact that it's male, there's one X and one Y. Um, so if you're attending this presentation, you're interested in the PGT aspects of an IVF cycle. So what is PGT? PGT is pre-implantation genetic testing. So as the name implies, we're testing embryos before we even implant them into the uterus. So this is, it's different from prenatal testing. So prenatal testing would be what happens during a pregnancy. So this is even before the pregnancy is created. So pre-implantation genetic testing is a, a test performed during an IVF cycle with the goal being to improve the chances of getting pregnant and having a healthy baby. So there's three different types of PGTA testing. So, PG, so sorry, three different types of PGT testing. So the first type is PGTA, and this is testing for aneuploidy. So aneuploidy is testing for the number of chromosomes in an embryo, so we're counting them. So we've discussed that humans should have 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46. So embryos with an incorrect number of chromosomes typically don't result in a successful pregnancy or could lead to the birth of a child with a genetic condition. So genetic conditions such as Down syndrome or Edwards syndrome would be involved. So there would be extra chromosomes. So embryos with the correct number of chromosomes have a much better chance of being achieving a successful pregnancy and a healthy baby. So PGTA identifies embryos with the correct number of chromosomes so we can select those with the best chance of pregnancy. So the next type of PGT testing would be PGTM. Now PGTM is testing for monogenic diseases. So this is used by people who have a known increased risk of passing on a genetic condition caused by a single gene defect. So one tiny little single gene is causing a problem. So an example of these diseases would be cystic fibrosis, sickle cell Huntington's. So the patients know that they have these conditions or they're at risk of these conditions due to family history and they don't want to pass those diseases on to the children. And the third type of PGT testing is PGT-SR. Now SR is for structural rearrangements. So these test for changes in the size or the arrangement of the chromosomes. So people with chromosome rearrangements are at an increased risk of producing embryos with the incorrect amount of genetic material. And that typically doesn't lead to a successful pregnancy. So these rearrangements are rare, but a person who's born with them may be completely normal or may have some degree of disability, depending on where the break is in the chromosome and where it's attached to. So you can see this, this kind of schematic down the bottom here. You can see part of this chromosome is broken off, part of this chromosome is broken off, and they've switched places. So that plays havoc with some, or obviously depends on where, which chromosomes are affected and where they're stuck on to but sometimes the body doesn't work as well as it should, or it may not even be compatible with life. So we've got our, hang on, where are we? So we've talked about the embryology. We've talked about the blastocyst. So now we're gonna talk about getting a biopsy. So these purple boxes are all the things that would happen within sim swords. And we'll get to some blue boxes in a minute. And that's where Cooper Genomics expertise comes in. So Cooper Genomics is the company that we would send the biopsy material to, uh, to test it and then send us the results. So we're gonna talk about now getting the piece of biopsy material. Okay, so 
When we check the embryos on the morning of day five of their development, we want to see a few cells from the trophectoderm, the bit that's going to help create the placenta in the pregnancy. We want to see them hatching out of that jelly shell. So if none of the cells are hatching yet, we can make a little hole in the zona pellucida, that jelly shell, and that will allow us to go into the embryo and pluck out a few of the cells. So I'm just going to play this. Now, I'm just going to say first, don't be alarmed. Okay, this video looks harsh, but what we're doing is we're carefully taking a small piece of the embryo from the part that becomes the placenta. So the part of the inner cell mass, the bit that makes the baby is all the way over here. So we're taking a few cells from the part of the embryo that becomes the placenta. So we take hold of those cells, we laser the, the gaps between the cells, and then we're going to let go of the blastocyst. We're going to overlap those two little glass pipettes, the two little tubes, and we're going to flick the piece of loosened tissue off the embryo. So the flicking movement is a quick movement to dislodge those cells, but the flicking movement is much less traumatic to an embryo than either pulling them away and stretching them away, which will damage the surrounding cells, or completely lasering them off, which will degrade the DNA within the cells. So it looks scary. And believe me, the first few times that we do this on training embryos, it is scary, but it is a controlled movement. And we know that the embryos survive much better doing it this way compared to the older methods of, of obtaining a biopsy. And the DNA quality is much better for, for genetic results as well. So once we get the, the biopsy piece of material separated from the embryo, then the embryo is taken into a separate dish and it's frozen. And the piece of biopsy tissue is placed carefully into a little tiny tube. So here we've taken this biopsy here. The cells that we've taken are now placed into a little tube. And this is what the little tubes look like. And then the tiny little tube is popped into the freezer. And then when we're ready to ship it to Cooper Genomics, we pop it in a, a cold box and send it across to London. So... Here's my, sorry, I'm just going to play the next slide. So we've got our little piece of biopsy material. So we're left with our embryo and our embryo is now going to be frozen. So to successfully freeze embryos, what we actually have to do is we dehydrate them. Because for example, if you put water in an ice cube tray and you put that in the freezer, it does two things. It forms crystals and it expands a little bit. And this expansion and this crystal formation will damage cells and will damage embryos. So we dehydrate these embryos, we remove some of the water from within each of the cells, and then we freeze them. So this process is called vitrification, and vitrification literally means like glass. So there's no crystal formation, and the embryo is protected within a tiny little bubble of fluid, which freezes almost instantly. So to freeze these embryos, we put them in what's called a high security straw. So it's like a tiny, skinny little drinking straw. And it's got an insert here, this red rod here, to hold the embryo. So the embryo sits in a gusher right down the end of this rod. And then it's inserted into the straw. And then we seal the other end of the straw to protect it. And then it's plunged into liquid nitrogen. So this keeps the embryo at minus 196 degrees um, until the embryo is then ready to thaw out. So embryos, once they're frozen, do not develop and do not degrade while they're, while they're at minus 196 degrees. So this photo is, oh, sorry, let's go back a bit here. This photo is one of our tanks. So each patient is given an address within a tank, a specific address. So we know where every single embryo is for any patient at any point in time. So for example, your embryos might be located in Fiona, canister two, cane one. So Fiona is the name of the tank. The canister is this bucket. So it's this, can you see here, this metal bucket is the canister and each of these canes are allocated to a single patient. So the patient's embryos are stored in a little goblet, a little um, plastic tube at the bottom of these canes. So embryo survival rates, meaning that the embryo comes out of the freezer exactly the same way as it went in from embryos that are vitrified using these techniques is over 98%. So we've frozen our embryo now. We're going to talk about our role with um, involving Cooper genomics within the PGTA cycle. So the cells that we removed from the trophectoderm are then placed in the tube and they're going to 
be sent to Cooper Genomics in uh, a London laboratory. So Cooper Genomics have over 27 years of experience with PGT testing, and they've tested over half a million samples to date. So each piece of embryo that is processed there is tested for the number of chromosomes it contains, and then they help us to select the best possible embryo for the patient. Data is analysed by their, their senior scientists in their labs, and then they give us a report on the genetics of each embryo. So the machine at Cooper Genomics copies the DNA. So we send those little tubes to Cooper Genomics. They copy the DNA in each of those little tubes hundreds and hundreds of times, and they end up getting results like these. And then their senior lab staff would analyze this, um, this image, and then they would send us a report. So you can see in the first image that all of these little dots are within the mid range. So they're within these two lines. So that means there is a balanced number of chromosomes. And then once we get down to the end of the image, there's a, an unbalanced portion. So this would mean that there's only one copy of each of the chromosomes. So this would mean we have only one X and only one Y. So this is a normal male embryo. So at the bottom image, this shows us that the, at first it is kind of balanced, but then you can see up here, there is showing that there's more DNA than expected. So I think this is chromosome eight. So there's more chromosome eight than we expected. So there's, a, there's an extra chromosome eight within this embryo. We go a little bit further, there's less DNA than we would anticipate for, I think that one's chromosome 16, meaning that the embryo is, has gained one chromosome 8 and is missing a chromosome 16. So this embryo is abnormal. So abnormal would be referred to as aneuploid and normal would be referred to as euploid. So these are several possible results from PGTA testing which will appear on the biopsy results that Cooper Surgical would send us. So the first and most desirable result is euploid. So the, this means the embryo has the correct number of chromosomes in every cell that was in the biopsy. So this embryo has a higher chance of pregnancy, a lower risk of miscarriage, and a reduced chance of a baby being born with a genetic condition. So the next possible option is aneuploid. So aneuploid means that the embryo has an incorrect number of chromosomes in every cell that was in the biopsy. So an aneuploid embryos typically do not result in successful pregnancies, or if they do, may lead to the birth of a child with a genetic condition such as Down syndrome or Edwards syndrome or Patel syndrome or all those kind of syndromes. The third possible option is mosaic. Now, this is where it gets a little bit more complex and confusing. So mosaic embryos contain two or more different chromosome patterns within the one embryo. So there's a mixture of both normal and abnormal cells in the same embryo. And I'll go, I'll go into this a little bit more in a minute, but I've got a different picture a little bit further on in the, in the presentation. So there might be an option to transfer these embryos if there's only a couple of cells affected, but this has to be discussed with the doctor at a return consultation and possibly even um, seek some advice from a qualified genetic counselor as well before we consider transferring mosaic embryos. Um, the fourth option is abnormal. So these embryos have three or more different abnormalities within a single cell or within several cells of the, of the embryo. So these are completely abnormal embryos and these would not be suitable to transfer. And the last option is no result. Now this occasionally happens due to poor DNA quality and it just means that Cooper, sorry, sorry, Cooper Genomics weren't able to get any results from the biopsy. So Again, this will be discussed with a doctor if this happens in a cycle. But the, the two choices, I suppose, would be, the first choice would be to just transfer the embryo regardless. So it's as if it's never been biopsied and never been tested. Or what we can do is we can attempt to re-biopsy the embryo. So what that would mean would be that we would have to thaw out the embryo, re-biopsy it, refreeze it, and send that second biopsy piece for testing just to see if we can get a different result. So this is uh, just a little bit, a little graph to talk about uh, maternal age. So to give you some idea of the chances of having a euploid or normal embryo, it's usually determined by the woman's age. So in this graph, you can see the purple line is normal embryos. So if the lady is under 37 years old, her chance of having a normal embryo 
or the chance of an embryo, sorry, the chance of an embryo being normal is about 50%. And this drops significantly down to around 15% if she's over 42. So similarly, the red line is the aneuploid, the abnormal embryos. You can see that this increases with advancing maternal age as well. So once Cooper Genomics have completed their testing, we receive results via email. And these results are uploaded to the patient's file. And then when they're ready, the patient or the couple would come in for the return consultation with one of our doctors. So at the return consultation, um, you'll be seen by one of the doctors here at SimSores and the results of the biopsied embryos will be discussed. So the, this form at the top uh, shows an example of the report which would be sent from Cooper Genomics to us. So it outlines the overall result, so euploid or aneuploid or mosaic. It um, talks about which chromosomes are impacted so, and then it gives us an interpretation by their scientists. So these recommendations will impact the decisions made by our doctors as to which embryos would be suitable for a frozen embryo transfer, and even potentially in which order they should be transferred. So this is the picture I was alluding to a little bit earlier. This is trying to explain the, the mosaic embryo. So this one is a euploid embryo. So if I take biopsy here, you can see all the cells have a normal number of chromosomes. They're all green. This blue one is completely aneuploid. So all the cells in this little biopsy piece would be abnormal. You can see here in the mosaic embryo, if we take the same biopsy piece, some of them are abnormal in blue and some of them are normal in green. So they, you can see like here, here in the above report, you'll see a high level mosaics, a low level mosaic. So that just gives us an idea of how many of the cells had this, this problem, had this, this deletion or this addition of chromosomes in them. So now whether or not these embryos would be suitable to, buy, to transfer would need obviously the, the advice of the doctors and the genetic counselors as well. So the, we were talking before about having the 23 pairs of chromosomes in a human cell. So the two chromosome ones, the two chromosome twos, the two chromosome threes. You can see here, there's three copies of chromosome 16. So this would be called trisomy 16. So if this embryo created a pregnancy, and it, it could, it could create a pregnancy, it would likely end in a first trimester miscarriage. So trisomy 16 is one of the leading causes of miscarriage. So this embryo, if we found this in one of the biopsied embryos, this embryo would not be recommended by the doctor for transfer because we know that this embryo would cause likely miscarriage. So this is how PGTA increases the chance of pregnancy and live birth. So embryos with abnormal chromosome numbers are not transferred. So the embryos which are transferred are known to have a normal chromosome number and are statistically more likely to implant and produce a healthy baby. So we've come to the last part of the PGTA treatment cycle, and that is transfer day. So when the transfer day arrives, usually in the morning, the lab would phone the patient just to confirm that they're happy for us to go ahead with the thaw. We would remind the patient to have a full bladder for the transfer, and we would confirm the transfer time. So we'd often also confirm which embryo we were going to thaw. So particularly in case the PGTA, PGTA tested embryos, this is particularly important. And like I said before, over 98% of the embryos that were frozen on day five and six will survive the, thaw, the freezing and thaw process to, to be transferred. So once the nursing staff brings a patient in the procedure room, the doctor prepares to do the embryo transfer. So you can see the picture here. This is a, an ultrasound image of a transfer occurring. So the image actually comes from the top. So there'd be an ultrasound probe here, and that's resting on the patient's tummy. This bladder is this big black space here. So we ask them to have a full bladder because it makes the transfer a little bit easier. It helps us to, to see the image a little bit better. And then when the doctor's ready, they'll pass through the transfer catheter and it, you can see it actually moving through the uterus here. So this is the uterus. And when you see the embryo transfer happen, there's often, there's often a little flash as the embryo is deposited into the lining. So then once the transfer is complete, the doctor hands back the transfer catheter to the embryologist. And we would always check under the microscope to make sure that the embryo has left the catheter. 
then we will call out clear and the patient and the doctor knows that the, the embryo has been successfully deposited into the uterus and that's the transfer complete. There's usually no sedation and no needles involved. So we know that PGTA euploid normal embryos decrease miscarriage rates and increase live birth rates. So why don't we do it for everyone? Well, you've seen that it's invasive. You've seen the video. We're not going to improve the embryo by taking cells from it. And there is a small chance that the embryo will not survive the biopsy, the freeze and the thaw process. So it's usually recommended where the potential benefit of this testing outweighs the risk to the embryo. So it could be recommended for patients who've had a series of miscarriages in the past with no explanation. It could be recommended for ladies who are over 35 years old. I don't like the term advanced maternal age, but there, there you are. Um, anyone experiencing unexplained infertility, so they've, they've been trying for pregnancy, there's no pregnancy and they, they, nobody knows why, we can't find a cause of it. Uh, it can be recommended for patients who've had previous IVF attempts with no pregnancy. And even some patients will opt for PGTA just for peace of mind. So it helps them to reduce the number of transfers they would need to go through to ensure a healthy pregnancy or a healthy pregnancy. And this, this is really what it comes down to. This is really the take home message. So this is why we're doing PGTA testing. It comes down to live births. So this is the graph that's actually taken from the HFBE data, which is in the UK, and it's studied over 190,000 cycles. And what you can see is the two bars, two different color bars, the purple bar and the light blue bar. So the light blue bar is the live birth rates for a PGT tested embryo. And they're significantly higher. The light blue bars are significantly taller in all age groups. So under 35 this is maternal age now, under 35, 35 to 37, and then advancing up to the over 44. So you can see that the blue bars are always higher than the purple non-PGTA tested embryos. So you can also see that the PGTA reduces the effect of maternal age. So do you remember the graph a couple of, a couple of slides ago, there was the cross. So the euploid sort of decreased as uh, with advancing maternal age and, and euploid increase. So this is almost negating the, the effect of maternal age. So you can see a patient who is under 35 with a non-tested embryo, has the chance of a live birth at about 34%. And patients between 40 and 42 with a tested embryo have the same live birth chance as a lady who was under 35 with a non-tested embryo. So it's reducing the effect of maternal age. So that's, that's really the take home message that I, I wanted to get across here. So, and this is why we do what we do. We want, we want single healthy babies in arms taking home to be with their parents. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and I hope you've enjoyed the webinar and hope it's answered some questions that might've brought up some more questions for you. Um, so I'll hand back to Eva. If you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with us during, with the, uh, the little Q and A box at the top and, and we'll see if we can help you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nandi. That's okay. Um, so one of the questions that came in was, uh, what grade of embryos are classed as good enough to go for testing? Good enough to go for testing would be AA, AB or BB. So they have to be either top quality or good quality. So typically those embryos would be, would be able to, to ascertain the difference between the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm. They need to have plenty of cells in the trophectoderm because obviously we're going to biopsy some. So they need to either be top quality or good quality for us to be able to biopsy them. Perfect. And this other one, so can you tell the sex from this test? Well, we, in Ireland, we are not allowed to know the sex of the embryos. So that the, there is some exclusions where the genetic um, issue is sex linked. So if, if something is, is linked to a particular sex, if the, the disease that patients will be looking for is linked to a particular sex, they will release the, the information as to whether it's male or a female embryo, but typically they do not share that information with us. Okay, perfect. So they will know, but we won't. Those Cuba yeah. genomics will know, but they won't release the okay. information. Okay, no, that's really interesting. Um, so this question here, if you've had a 
B, C, that, um, assuming blastocysts that could not be tested, can the embryo be still frozen or is it discarded? If it's, if it's good quality, um, it can be frozen. The reason that we don't freeze poor quality embryos is because typically they don't survive very well. And obviously we are putting them through a bit of a rigorous procedure where we're vitrifying them, we're dehydrating them, we're freezing them. We, when we come to thaw them out, they need to rehydrate and the cells need to be healthy for us to be able to do that. So to create that exchange of fluids, the cells need to be healthy enough to do that exchange process to then survive the freezing and thawing procedure. So if the, if the cells aren't healthy, if it's not a good quality embryo, the cells typically don't survive very well. So that's why we don't freeze them. Perfect. Um, it seems to be, if anyone else has any questions, we can hang on um, another minute or two. So if you do just pop them into the Q and A. Um, but yeah, Mandy, that's been really, really informative. I, I've learned so much as well from today. <laughs> And um, it's just it's just a kind of it's really fascinating just getting to know these procedures a lot better and, and how they can really help patients. Anybody else? Anything else I can help with? Um, oh, so do sims freeze less than a, a BB quality? We don't freeze less than BB, no. Hmm. Um, okay, I think that seems to be, oh, here we go. How long does it take um, to get the results? Once, so from an egg collection, we would then not do the biopsies until day five or day six of the embryo development. Once we've done the biopsies, they will typically be kept for a few days in the freezer and they'll be shipped to Cooper Genomics. So that takes a day or two for them to get there. And once they get to Cooper Genomics, we say about four weeks. So typically they are back before that four weeks timeline, but just to give us enough wiggle room in case they're, they're a little bit slower in terms of, you know, they're, they're a bit busier and they're not getting the reports out on time. We do typically recommend about four weeks from, from the point where we send them off until we, we ask the patients to come back for return consultation. Sure. Um, so can you opt for a transfer instead of freezing if the quality of the embryo is not is yeah is not good enough? You could, and that would um, would need to be discussed with the doctor. So they they would advise you whether it's worth transferring the embryo or you know anything other than that. So that would be a decision that the the patients would would make with the advice of the doctor. Perfect. Um, no problem, just a thank you there, so thank you. You're um, welcome. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, I think that looks like that's all the questions. Like I said, if you do have any further ones or anything that maybe you're not comfortable asking on this forum um, or anything kind of maybe a little bit specific to yourself, um, please do reach out to the communications at sims.ie and we'll, we'll do our best to, to answer any queries you have. Um, but again, thank you so much um, for, for attending this evening. I hope you found it informative. I certainly did. And um, thank you so much, Mandy, for your time. Really appreciate it. It's um, my pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you in the clinic soon. Perfect. <laughs> Have a lovely evening. Bye. Thanks, Emil. Take care. Bye-bye.